Dr. Ella Feiner's research uh, queries the ownership of cultural expression through sound, uh, informing lectures, performances, and events, including current projects like Her Moon is a Captured Object, an experiment in orbital translation for the City Talks Back, uh, Teatro Mundi and Onassis Stegi. Burning House, Burning Horse, which is a video essay on debt and centuries old forgetting for Almanac projects, and The Heart in Her Mouth, which is three co-authored intersecting essays for Infrasonica. Recent writing includes a chapter called Feminism and Sound, Listening in Common in Uncommon Times. So her first book, Acoustic Commons and the Wild Life of Sound, is uh, forthcoming. Uh, thank you, Ella, for joining us. Dr. Chelsea Burks, who is joining us from Canada, is uh, uh, the Learning and Outreach Manager at the Cinematheque in Vancouver, where she directs educational programming in filmmaking, film studies and media literacy. She received her PhD in Film and Television Studies from the University of Glasgow, and she teaches uh, Film Studies at the University of British Columbia. Her research focuses on film philosophy and transgression, and her first book, Limit Cinema, Transgression and the Non-Human in Contemporary Global Film, is very shortly forthcoming from uh, Bloomsbury, Bloomsbury this year. So we are uh, delighted uh, that they are both joining us tonight. We will begin with um, Ella's paper, and Ella will talk to us about acoustic attention, deep affiliation, and the work of listening. So this is about listening as an acoustic attention that collapses distance, that brings bodies closer. It is a talk about listening as a form of consenting to distance in the words Simone Weil uses for the love and friendship that decenters the singular self. And it is with this ethos of deep affiliation that is made of and ever strengthened by the power of two and the distance between that I consider how bodies listen. So it was during a conversation with Tom Weston and Uruk Shirhan in the end days of last year that Tom named what I was describing of finding a profound new attention to our work developed in kinship and conversation, deep affiliation. The ideas in this text come from many different conversations and events, events both true and imagined although it is hard to tell in this winter where and how things separate. I wrote to someone recently, I'm finding the interconnections between everything and it is by turns exhausting and brilliant. She asked, what is interconnecting? And I'm sorry that I was interrupted and I never responded. The answer was and still is too large for me to know how to write in shorthand. It might be expressed by a sentence left unended by a thought suspended midair, by finding and abandoning a rhythm so we can find one together. It is why I am working in the space left open by Emily Dickinson's M dashes, a space that feels as wide and strange, as full as Jana Levin's descriptions of black holes. The poet, the mystic and the cosmologist, none of them so simply defined by these one word occupations have already been named but appear and disappear in what follows as those who hold the space and time in which I propose the work of listening happens in a tense that is immediate because the work, work of listening does not delay attention, but gives into it, gives to it. Deep in this writing, in my speech, there is a swan's heart beating, a heart recorded by Richard Ridgway, the owner of a wild fowl refuge in County Cork, Ireland, 50 years ago, and nearly to the day. We are only one month off the alignment of years, a half century old swan's heart, a heart I cannot unhear, a heart now beating through everything I write about. Why? The beat reached me in a particular present tense two years ago and has suspended me in a continuous present of its own making. So this was a sound file that I heard from the British Library Sound Archive. And I will put the link um, to listen to this after the talk so you can go and hear it, because I don't think it will translate very well on Zoom. And it's a sound of a swan's heartbeat and the recordist Richard Ridgway 
is very, very close to the swan, holding the swan and recording the heart. While I am listening, writing with the swan's heart, I keep hearing it in unexpected places, beating the bounds, so to speak, of an acoustic commons that is the interconnected world sustained to, through the sharing of sound, forces, energies, vibrations, because this swan's heartbeat is still revealing to me, through the category of wildlife recording, something about sound that is wilder than can be contained by category, or tense, maybe even wilder than the record will ever, can ever allow us to know. The record in the audio archive being as much a container as the subject area the record falls into or out of. Because this record exposed for me in the relation it documents between the swan and the recordist and the way it attunes my listening to it and around it, how the beat of our bodies acoustically scales proximity, how the beat in relation collapses distance. My approach to thinking about acoustic attention is through this beat, the beat that is a kind of moving vessel in itself, the beat that ushers so many associated sounds into its own tense, the beat that our orally diverse bodies will always make the dimensions of differently, our feeling for this beat never completely transparent to each other. And surely this is part of the power of the diverse, that we don't always have to make sense to each other. We can feel out the words, the vocabulary for our oral experience, and it is difficult because it is obscure. Let's let it be difficult and hold the space for obscurity. When I feel I am in the present with a sound, I am close by, close at ear, close at hand, at heart, even while my ear pulls sounds from far away into new focus. The temporality of listening is also about how we receive the sounds, how we take the time, our time, to listen. In my experience with these ears, I miss things as I pick up on a sound, a beat, a word, a cry, a pitch, and attend to it with a far larger temporal attention span than the time span of the sonic cue. A beat, a beat in the hearing, but the two events of the sound and its hearing do not occupy the same temporality. I love this as much as I am confused by it, that a detail can last a lifetime. This is sonorous tense, a tense that is elastic time, peculiar. As soon as I say now, it is not. Imagine with me for a moment, we are deep in the galaxy swirl among the stars. Close up, we take time with the detail, but we cannot apprehend the shape of the whole. That shape only becomes apparent from far away. The spiral appears so long as we have some distance. And while the bigger picture makes new sense of the detail, now the detail is the imagined part. Sound so much slower than the speed of light is always also in delay. We sit across the table from each other and all that you perceive of me is in the past my voice and body different, distanced by the microsecond. So when I say I am listening to you now in the present, the tension inherent in this tense is that my experience of the present is always in relation to what is at distance, what has passed or what may come to pass. Acoustic attention is a practice of retrieval and anticipation. Details both clearer and obscured quieter and amplified. We all compose with what we choose to louden to our senses, remixing records pulled from other times as we listen with an ear to the room, the bodies on the floor. You are hearing me speak, but maybe listening elsewhere, to an elsewhere outside the window, an elsewhere in a daydream, a memory, or your breathing beating body as what is closest and most audibly, most tenderly present to yourself. Astrophysicist Jana Levin, writing about Jem Finer's 1,000-year composition Long Player, which is another kind of beating heart for my lifetime and beyond, gives an example of how time dilates in space by asking us to imagine bodies holding clocks, meeting each other, floating. She writes, If I float through empty space, clutching a clock to reassure me that I exist, 
I can watch time pass, the relentless ticking marking out breath and life. But if someone else races by clutching a clock, a reassurance of his existence, it would appear to me that his clock ran slowly. If he was moving at nearly the speed of light, he would appear to move slowly, talk slowly, even age slowly, like a broken movie projection. But from his perspective, he was the one motionless in space when I whizzed by. To him, it would appear that my clock ran slowly, that my motor skills dragged, that I aged slowly. There would be no frame of reference to contradict either of us. We'd both be right. Do the clocks sound as slow as they appear when floating by, attached to others' bodies? What if the floating body in space reached out and pulled the other body close? Would their clocks then tick time together? What if the bodies across the table from one another left the table and held each other tight? Would these bodies now occupy the same temporal frame of reference? Is this what I am listening to or what I hope for in my listening when I hear the swan's heart beating time, a rhythmic belonging to one another? Richard Ridgway recorded the swan's heartbeat while holding the body close. Suppose it was not a clock I carried then to reassure me of my existence, but another body, a swan's, its heart rate responding to the proximity of my body, responding to my existence, responding to the strokes not of a clock but a hand. It is hearing the acoustic scale of the heart that collapses distance an ear, a microphone to the chest. The recordist Richard Ridgway invites us into this acoustic relationship, a fellowship of sonorous relation, a reminder we listen with our heart. Listening with the heart is also to place our bodies in the waves, to move in the current while listening to it. As Jack Halberstam has described in their description of the extra musical about an expanded sense of when or how music happens, this ethos is one of being in it while listening. We enfold details into our sense of the moving present and calibrate the temporality of other bodies into our own experience. Listening is an action that not only brings bodies close, but can dissolve separation. Because when we listen, we participate in making the sound we attend to. It takes work to listen. Listening is an effort we make or we do not. Something we are now familiar with is the government, the UK government, saying it is listening to the science. One word does so much work here to assure us that due attention is being given, and a form of attention that has within it a binding action. Listening brings bodies closer. Listening could stand in here for working closely with. But if listening is a practice of conscious attunement, of deep collectivity, and of practicing fellowship, and I am thinking here about Fred Moton's This Is How We Fellowship, then the instrumentation of listening by the government is not only a sense co-opted by the state, but a rhetorical wrangling, a violent reduction of the sensorial relationship that is the promise of listening to each other, of being close. I opened with the heartbeats that had suspended me and taught me more about listening than I ever imagined when I first heard them. And now at this near end point, I want to turn to how this is the work of listening, the work that seeks connection and deep affiliation, the work that takes effort, the work that is the time it takes to listen. Because listening is giving, gifting of attention, giving time. Following Yoga Samantas, listening is a gift, is a present. Might turning to listening as work undercut the inherent gift in lending an ear, though? Depends on who is offering the ear and how it is offered. So what does it mean when the government says it is in listening mode? A shorthand ministers have used across myriad issues from cutting tax credits to leaving the European Union. If it sounds operational, maybe because it is. This administration of the optional ear. Listening, as I hope I've described in one take before, is no casual action. It is specific, it is selective, while being temporally and spatially plural. 
It is conditioned by our bodies, the different workings of our ears and the persuasions of our hearts. It also, as this time of social distance has shown, is what can powerfully collapse distance. It is what brings us closer. It brings our bodies closer. Scaled up to the size of the institution that is the UK government, the intricate and nuanced care inherent in listening is unsustainable. Was it ever offered, though, as anything else? Institutional listening forgets not only the physics, but the philosophy of attending to each other by ear. Institutional listening is a forgetting how listening is a practice of sustaining each other. The institution forgets because it does not need to remember this. It does not intend listening to foster any relationship. The government say they are in listening mode. This is a way of saying we are working in the immediacy of our listening, giving real time attention in the form of a body on the other end of the line. But such institutional missions reduce this practice of responsibility and reciprocity while not taking seriously the ethics of employing a process that is always selective, that can never sustain an open ear to all. Listening necessitates care because there is always a selection made in what the listener makes present for themselves and others. When institutionalised, when politicised, because listening carefully depends on picking up what is important to make present, selection is suspect because selection is spin. This kind of co-opted bureaucratic listening flattens the action and denies the diversity of ways in which to listen and hear. The success of listening mode as a device, an offer, is in its persuasion as an action of the present tense, of immediate connection, of being close enough to speak and be heard. Listening mode produces a full sense of proximity and immediacy to those who offer it. When we listen, however we listen, we take sound into ourselves, the vibrations, the beats. When we listen, we are relative, we are in relation. What does the state in listening mode listen to, listen for? Significantly, there are bodies in Parliament who are always listening, and listening so closely that they take it in turns, only five minutes at a time, to listen to what has been said in the houses and these are the reporters. Their job is to listen in the continuous present of an intensive fraction, their turn, as it's called, of the whole debate, and then to write up what they have heard alongside recordings. This becomes the reported transcripts of Parliament published by Hansard. It is ironic that an institution with one kind of practice of close listening built into its infrastructure seemingly forgets that a body's capacity for doing so is temporally limited. In order to record what happens in Parliament, Hansard have relay teams of reporters, their primary job to listen, to listen and then listen again to the recording, acoustically attend in acute detail. The discourse around institutional listening gives power to the ears who are offering it, when listening is a reciprocal practice. This use of listening also denies the body who participates in conversation differently who listens with their body, their other senses, and may speak in many ways. Listening mode always presumes there will be an ear listening for speech, but this is a vastly reduced understanding of the diverse conditions of listening and of hearing. What about the ear that hears shapes, volumes, the ear that hears other dimensions? What about the ear with interference, the high pitch line above everything, or the metal buzz at the edges? What about the damaged ear? Or what about the parts of the body attuned, the heart listening for beats, the hand listening for the heart? Heartbreak is always present tense, my friend Sheila Chukwulozi writes to me. Maybe this is what I'm hearing in the swan's heart. The unbearable heartbreak is something that happens if you have a heart. The clock of heartbeats, an instrument of the night watch, those of us who take it in turns to listen out so others of us can rest. Acoustic attention then is the work that is a gift and is so much about listening out for each other in whatever forms we are able, in whatever ways we can.
Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for that, Ella. And we will um, start to reflect on uh, what we have heard together um, after we've heard from Chelsea. Sue's paper is going to explore transgression and the non-human in contemporary global film. Um, good evening, everybody, or good morning. Um, as was mentioned in the beginning, I'm joining you from Vancouver, Canada, where it's, ju it's not, just about 9.30 a.m. Uh, my talk today is loosely based on ideas from my forthcoming book, Limit Cinema, Transgression and the Non-Human in Contemporary Global Film, which is published by Bloomsbury as part of the Thinking Cinema series edited by David Martin Jones and Sarah Cooper. To first give some context about the general ideas in my book, uh, Limit Cinema explores how contemporary global cinema represents the relationship between humans and nature, a relationship that has become increasingly fraught over the first decades of the 21st century with proliferating social and environmental crises. The films discussed in my book, from Ben Wheatley's Kill List to Nanny Wilde's Connelline Arland Beautiful to a pitch upon Weir Sethical's Uncle Boonmi Who Can Recall His Past Lives, address these problems by reflecting or renegotiating the terms of our engagement with the natural world. Limit Cinema draws from the philosophy of Georges Bataille and more recent conversations from film eco-criticism, speculative realism, and the non-human turn to argue that certain films attempt to transgress the limits of human experience and that such limit cinema has the potential to help us rethink our relationship with nature. For the purposes of my talk today, I'm going to focus specifically on films that trouble distinctions between subject and object. I do not think that these distinctions are possible to eradicate entirely. Instead, Limit Cinema reveals the boundaries between subject and object to be fragile, unstable, and contradictory, even if they persist in our perceptual and conceptual frameworks. In my book, I write extensively about the relationship between sight and human mastery. Cinema is a technological inheritor of the optical technologies that since the Enlightenment have offered us greater understanding of the world around us, from the camera obscura to the microscope to photography. Psychoanalytic film theories from the 1970s quite famously articulate this idea of the spectator as master of the image. Jean-Louis Baudry writes that cinema inherits perspective from Renaissance art and technology, which were made possible by the camera obscura in particular. Uh, perspective in Renaissance art is centered on the position of the subject facing the image. Audrey writes that, quote, based on the principle of a fixed point by reference to which the visualized object, objects are organized, it, perspective, specifies in return the position of the subject, the very spot the subject must necessarily occupy. In single point perspective, lines open up from a centered point towards the edges of the frame and invite the spectator into the image. Baudry contrasts this to Greek theater, which stages its action in relation to a variety of perspectives from the crowd circling the stage. Because single point perspective addresses itself towards a spectator who views the entirety of the image at once, Baudry argues that the spectator occupies a position of relative mastery over the image. Um, all of these films are from, or all of these stills are from a film called Tectonics, which I write about quite a bit in the book. Um, I won't go into too much detail about the film here, uh, except to say that it makes heavy use of single point perspective in a way that is a useful illustration of the idea. Immediately following my eye surgery, when my vision was at its worst and the external world was reduced to bleary splotches of colored light, I thought a lot about Baudry and her, his ideas about perceived mastery over the external world. I definitely felt less in control because I couldn't see, which was to be expected. But what struck me as odd was that this feeling was paired with a heightened sense of claustrophobia, as though the world was closing in on me. Visual mastery implies keeping things at a proper distance. With single point perspective, all planes of sight are properly accounted for and sufficiently far away from the observer to be distinguishable. In my myopic state, the world was collapsed into a single plane, a crush of color and light. Philosopher Jean-Luc Nancy writes that sight is our preferred sense in part because of the unique distance it maintains from its object. Smell and taste are more base and animalistic because they involve ingestion, a material involvement between the sensing subject and the object being sensed as particles enter our nose or food passes our tongue. Sight is comparably sterile, cerebral. I can see light emitted by a star at an unfathomable distance from my body on earth but I cannot taste, touch, smell, or hear it. I can imagine a disembodied perspective that sees, 
and maybe hears, but it is more difficult for me to imagine something without a body that smells or tastes. We have a mind's eye, but not a mind's nose or mouth. This disembodied perspective is more or less what I imagine when I think about God, a sort of mind's eye that can see things from very, very far away. This association between sight, distance, and mastery struck me as quite strange once I could no longer rely on my usual powers of vision. Why is it that we should have less control over something the closer we are to it? My myopic landscape of blurry lights was disconcerting to me because it felt so intimate. It made me feel as though I was pressing against the world around me, like there was less separation between my body and the world. My myopic perception felt more immediate precisely because I'd lost the in-between spaces that normally mediate between my eyes and the objects they perceive. I think this loss of control has to do with the distinction between subject and object, which is a necessary condition of the perceived mastery over nature. This separation is far more difficult to uphold when we acknowledge all the ways that our senses involve us materially in the world around us. I'm not used to thinking of my eyes as a physical organ. I tend to think of them more as a direct link to my brain, a window on the world. But the physical interaction between my eyes and the world has become more obvious to me over the last few days as I've had to surrender this sense of control, somewhat ironically in pursuit of better eyesight. I've been thinking about this not just because I've had not much else to do in the ab absence of Netflix and other screen-based media, but also because they are key ideas in my overall methodology. I'm interested in subject-object distinctions and the ways that they persist even when challenged or complicated by external phenomena. The examples of limit cinema in my book never entirely eradicate the subject-object distinction. Instead, they touch on the limit between external and internal spaces and reveal this boundary to be fragile and unstable. I'm going to talk about two examples that I think illustrate this instability of subject-object distinctions quite well. The first example from Jonathan Glazer's Under the Skin articulates the subject-object distinction in terms of sight. Uh, the second example from Lars von Trier's Nymphomaniac explores it in terms of sound. Neither example completely eradicates the distinction between subject and object. Instead, both films collapse distances and disorient spatial relations so that the spectator loses their comfortable sense of perspective on the film world. Under the Skin begins with a black frame and a blue light glowing in the distance. A jump cut brings us closer to the source before cutting again to reveal a series of circular shapes floating in a line away from the light. The shapes are vague and nearly abstract, but they might be a spaceship or some other kind of celestial object. The shapes eventually come to resemble a camera shutter before the image is suddenly illuminated and the artificial circular lines become a bright hazel human eye.
across a huge spatial range from cosmic to personal mediated through a camera provides an initial visual example of the way that Under the Skin deals with questions of human subjectivity. The film's title already evokes its concern with interiority, which it investigates through a series of ambiguous spaces and images that subvert our expectations. Though Under the Skin is a film about interiority, we are precluded from the thoughts of characters as there is no voiceover and very little dialogue. The spectator is therefore encouraged to read things on the surface. This surface, however, is constantly slipping and reversing. Jean-Luc Nancy writes about embodiment as a continual process of turning inside out, where we cannot finally determine interiority or exteriority. He writes, quote, the body is nothing but the outside, skin exposed, a network of sentient receivers and transmitters, all outside and nothing like me that would be held inside that wrapping. There is no ghost in the machine, no dimensionless point where I feel or feel myself feeling. The inside of the envelope is yet another outside, developed or de-enveloped, otherwise full of folds, turns, convolutions, and adhesions, full of invaginations, small heaps, and conglomerations. Invagination is a concept that Nancy borrows from Merleau-Ponty's theory of flesh, but it is also an embryological term referring to the moment in the development of the embryo when a spherical collection of cells indents to form a cavity that will eventually become the gut. This is where I use my 11th grade biology um, to explain a philosophical concept. I'm going to show an image because I think that it, um, that it helps here. So invagination marks the moment when an organism differentiates between its inside and outside and when it develops distinct germ layers. So we just have like a clump of cells called the blastula, but it gradually forms an envelope and turns inside out to form the cavity that becomes the gut. This happens in every organism, maybe except for like simple ones. Yeah, remember that it's been a while since I took biology. <laughs> um, but crucially, the inside of the organism, so it's, um, it's gut, basically, does not develop because its surface is punctured or penetrated from the outside, but rather because it folds in on itself. This means that we and other organisms are folded inside out, not merely in an abstract philosoph philosophical sense, but also in a physical one. When a zygote invaginates, it folds inwards to form a channel so that the outside passes through without penetrating the cell layers on either side. So our whole intestinal tract forms by folding inside out. Nancy uses this as a way of explaining our interiority as a play of surfaces that never accesses an internal essence or truth. Since our efforts to penetrate the inner core of our being can only result in creating more folds. Under the Skin is similarly preoccupied with questions of interiority, which it responds to not by discerning some internal truth, but rather representing subjectivization as an unstable shift between inner and outer spaces. Um, so to give another example, at one point in the film, Scarlett Johansson, who, uh, spoiler alert, is revealed to be some sort of inhuman alien in the end, um, at one point, she stops at a cafe and attempts to eat a slice of cake before abruptly coughing it back up. So she's trying to eat, but seems sort of incapable of it. Her failed attempt at eating suggests a curiosity about her inner self, a faith in her own interiority that turns out to be a dead end. Her attempt at ingestion results in revulsion, a blockage. A few scenes later, she tries to, um, she tries to have sex with a man that she meets on a bus. Uh, but she stops him suddenly shocked and leaps into the corner to, let, to shine a lamp on the place where her genitals should be. Uh, so she seems shocked, but it is unclear whether she is disturbed by the presence of an opening or the absence of one. 
Uh, though the final sequence of the film, re which reveals her skin to be covering a sort of opaque alien body implies the latter, that she's sort of blocked from her interiority by that, by that alien form. Uh, but the man's attempt to penetrate her apparently calls the integrity of her body into question. The alien's investigations into the holes in herself, her invaginations, the places where the body's boundaries break down or fold in on themselves, amount to little positive knowledge. These holes do not open onto a legible inner self. They are a dead end. But nor do they block out harm or outside influence. Her human skin, which is meant to be a protective shield over her hidden alien body, proves to be simultaneously fragile and impenetrable. As well as evoking a number of metaphysical connotations about interiority and embodiment, under the skin is quite literally about turning people inside out. Uh, so throughout the film, Scarlett Johansson seduces men and brings them to this sort of inky black pool where their skins are somehow removed. In one of these scenes, a man sinks into the alien's pool before he encounters the emptied skin of the previous victim. The question of what happened to the body inside the skin is answered in the next shot, which seems to be of a trough filled with sanguine liquid floating towards a red illuminated opening. Um, we've got sort of all of those images there, the void and the skin floating around, and then the, the red liquid that eventually will go towards the star. The liquid disappears into the hole before the shot transitions to a series of abstract red shapes, uh, then a red line, then a light that could be a star. The implication is maybe that the man's insides are sent elsewhere, and that the abstract images somehow represent the process through which this occurs. The shapes also look something like blood under a microscope, suggesting that the abstract images are not on a cosmic scale, but rather a molecular one, a closer look at what is under the skin. This enhances the sense of, of disorientation that pervades the scene and echoes the indeterminacy between inner and outer spaces that we saw in the opening sequence. These scenes are curiously spatially ambiguous. While in Michael Faber's novel, the humans hunted by the alien are killed and harvested through a process similar to factory farming, in the film, these machinations are far more mysterious. The men are not harvested and eaten by the alien, but instead are consumed by the space around her. The men sink into a void that destabilizes the difference between inside and outside, and somehow, in the process, they are turned inside out. Under the skin as a whole evokes a kind of slipperiness between inner and outer spaces. Proper distinctions between self and other fail to materialize, and instead, the film keeps repeating the visual gesture of the opening sequence. Celestial objects perceived from a god's eye view become more visceral and immediate. The distance that allows us to make things out clearly is continually called into question. While Under the Skin undermines visual mastery through images themselves, Nymphomaniac evokes spatial ambiguity through sound. The film opens with a black screen that runs for several moments to the sounds of water falling and metal creaking. I'm gonna play a few, uh, just sort of a minute of that so you get the idea. Um, there shouldn't be an image here, it's just sound. Hopefully you heard that basically just some metal creaking water falling and that goes on for several minutes before an image pops up. These sounds are immersive, aligning with eco-theorist Timothy Morton's idea of ambient poetics, which he writes about in Ecology Without Nature. Morton writes that, quote, ambience denotes a sense of a circumambient or surrounding world. It suggests something both material and physical, though somewhat intangible as if space itself had a material aspect. Morton traces the etymology of ambience to the Latin ambo on both sides and argues that ambient sounds destabilize boundaries between subject and object inside and outside. While the cinematic image, as mentioned earlier, gives the impression of objectivity through representational devices such as single point perspective, ambient sound collapses the distance between spectator and screen. Morton writes that acousmatic sound, so sound without a visible source, comes from nowhere, or it is inextricably bound up with the space in which it is heard. By disconnecting these initial sounds from their sources, Nymphomaniac initially refuses to posit the diegesis as something out there, 
in a world of a different order from the space inhabited by the spectator. This sense of ambiguity is recuperated into a more conventional representational framework when the image appears, as the sounds are retroactively tied to their sources. Water flows through drainage pipes and over a shed with a tin roof, rain trickles down walls, a metal fan creaks in the wind. Eventually, the camera settles on the main character, Joe, played by Charlotte Gainsbourg, lying prostrate in the alley, implying a new interpretation for these sounds. They might have been from Joe's perspective as she listened to the sound of the alley with her eyes closed. But before the image appears, there is a slipperiness between internal and external spaces characteristic of ambient sound more generally. The screen, which normally operates as a kind of intermediary, has failed to properly mediate between spectator and diegesis. In other words, during the opening black screen sequence, the ambient film world has leaked out into the real external world of the cinema. The externality of these sounds relative to the image is then reversed once again when they are revealed to be attached to Joe's particular sonic perspective. They simultaneously provide insight into a character's inner world while also belonging to the external space of the cinema. This slipperiness of subject-object distinctions is characteristic of the film overall, which wants us to lose grip on our sense of mastery over the narrative. There is a second use of black screen and ambient sound at the beginning of volume two, when Jo experiences her first orgasm as a child. We do not see this experience at first, but hear it through the ambient sounds of the mountain landscape where the event takes place. This technique is repeated again at the end of the film where Joe is implied to kill Seligman, the witness to her story throughout the film. Again, we do not see this event, but hear the gunshot and then Joe's footsteps fleeing the scene. These events do not take place for us at the comfortable distance afforded by the cinema screen, but instead occur in a way that is both too close for comfort and too far away to properly distinguish the details with any certainty. Choosing to articulate these events through ambient sound troubles the subject-object distinction without eradicating sense altogether. We still know what happens at the end of the movie, but our position in relation to these events has been uncomfortably called into question. To conclude, I'm going to somewhat clumsily reconnect these examples from my book to my musings about sight and sound inspired by my myopic post-surgery adventures. I am interested in the way that cinema can simultaneously uphold and trouble distinctions between subjects and objects. And the opening scenes of Nymphomaniac and Under the Skin do this by collapsing the distance between subject and screen usually offered by cinematic representation. Both films insist on sensory experiences that are more embodied than they first appear. The celestial objects in Under the Skin are related to the, trembl the trembling viscous membrane of a human eyeball. The disembodied acoustic perspective at the beginning of Nymphomaniac is retroactively tied to a woman's perspective as she listens to the sounds in the alley with her eyes closed. Though sight promises a distance between self and world, all sensory experience involves participation be between subject and object. Over the last few days, I've reflected particularly on the sensory experience of sound, which has always seemed somewhat disturbingly intimate to me. I listened to a lot of podcasts, um, but I'm picky and I don't like any podcast that seems too much like I'm just listening in on someone's conversations. Uh, there's something about the immediacy of sound which goes through headphones directly into my ears and inner space that feels overly intimate to me, especially if I'm hearing strangers talking. There's just always been something that unsettles me about it. I like podcasts that keep things at the level of objective facts or investigative reporting rather than podcasts that involve too much chit chat or casual conversation. While listening to a number of podcasts on the weekend, I reflected that this preference was really an attempt at mastery, a desire to keep myself out of remove from the sensory experience of listening. Jean-Luc Nancy reflects on the intimacy of sound in his work, Listening, where he writes that, quote, to listen is to enter that spatiality by which, at the same time, I am penetrated, for it opens up in me as well as around me, and from me as well as toward me. It opens me inside as well as outside, end quote. He connects this, this to the fact that while I cannot see myself seeing, my eyes are not directly visible to me, I do hear myself emitting sounds. If I make a sound and you hear it, we share in that experience of sound, which reverberates through our ears and bodies. I like this idea. The spaces between us are not keeping us at a distance like the planes of sight in single point perspective. 
Instead, listening is a particularly intersubjective experience and then it involves paying attention to these shared reverberations. Um, Listening does not collapse distinctions between subjects and objects, but nor does it reinforce distances between them. While sight positions the object in relation to a subject, sound orients two bodies in relation to one another. To briefly bring all of this back to my book, in the final chapter of my book, I describe these intersubjective sensory exchanges as love. Love similarly destabilizes subject-object distinctions without eradicating them. Love involves an intimate and sometimes uncomfortable sense of proximity with things that we would normally keep at a distance. Maybe this is what we mean when we say love is blind. Thank you.